I was thinking of maybe talking about the um, Samyutta Nikaya filled with love. The um, awakening factors with the Brahma Viharas. Because it's, uh, it's really the structure of the whole practice, I think. Um, like if you're ever Maybe some people wouldn't agree with what I'm going to say, but uh, if you're looking for a place where the like the you could you can actually find the six R's in a kind of a an explained way that the way that the Buddha would explain it, like the way that the uh, in the Buddha's words, that would be probably that sutta. Because we're used to having these four, right? We the boundless love, compassion, joy, and boundless calm. And we know, you know, like the Buddha teaches it like the same all the time. It's very, uh, very clear <laughs> when when these are. If we just learn that sequence it's quite easy to, to see that that's really how the buddha taught those but then it gets interpreted in all kinds of ways and then it gets it gets twisted around and uh but that sutta makes it really clear he it's probably one of the only sutta where he's going in really great details about how to practice this like uh there's another sutta where uh, the Sankhita sutta, the, sh the concise instruction that Bhikkhu comes and goes to the Buddha and says, uh, "Could you teach me the Dhamma Bhante quickly so I can understand fast and <laughs> easily, and I can just meditate diligent, uh, ardent, and resolute, and <laughs> become the Buddha's uh, heir." <laughs> and so he explains the Sankhita. He explains the the four Brahma Viharas. He doesn't say the jhanas, but he he basically, you know, practice. He says practice this with, you know, um, with joy, then without joy, then with thinking, then without thinking, then with uh, like uh, happiness, and then with balance of mind. Each of the Brahma Viharas. And that's a uh, that's another place where we really find a. Uh, a good breakdown of what to do with these things because yes it's that boundless um, presence but <laughs> beyond that <laughs> which there's no real <laughs> beyond <laughs> good you got it <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it's hard to go beyond something that's boundless. <laughs> so, good. <laughs> um, and then he explains the four f uh, foundations of mindfulness, too, which in the same way. So it's really interesting that, that sutta, uh, we get to see uh, really an, a different approach to or l maybe like a, a different perspective or a deeper kind of insight into 
because it's like any teacher you know after a, a while you have people that you've taught quite a bit quite extensively some people come in but uh, less frequently I guess and then and then you just don't keep repeating the same thing all over every time you know like I, I've done that quite a bit like maybe the first year I was here and people kind of got fed up so we kind of <laughs> maybe that's um, that's a bit of a <laughs> hard way to put it but I know that a lot of people here have heard the fruits of the truth seeking life quite a few times and read the book that I wrote on it <laughs> uh, quite a few times so now some people you know they know that sutta really really well <laughs> and then I just read it and they're like oh yeah <laughs> I know this even though it's it's a nice sutta personally I don't get tired of it but <laughs> that's just me I'm just weird <laughs> um So the Buddha does that too, you know. He's not always repeating everything all the time. He, and most of these teachings, they're mainly for monks. So um, not they are exclusively for monks, but they were said to monastic uh, audience a lot of the time. And so we need to remember like the context of things and um, um, these Brahma Viharas when he explains them he he often uses the same way over and over again because that's just the way he's explaining it to everybody but then there's there are some bits of it that you know uh, that are not necessarily talked about in every sutta because you don't give like beginning meditation instructions every talk you know <laughs> so so but there's um but there are a few suttas where you can find that where you can find the material that is behind the the real practice itself uh, and how to how to actually work with it because it's one thing to for example generate boundless love or boundless goodwill however you want to call it metta um, to all living beings but it's another to practice it exactly the way that the Buddha taught it so and that's that's that is the way the Buddha taught it but there's there's other things that come into play like what do you do when there's a hindrance coming up and you're not with the love anymore so that's not really talked about um, in that particular sequence right because it just talks about it makes it sound quite easy that yeah no you just you just do that boundlessly and there's n there's not gonna be any problem <laughs> well that's not really <laughs> the case most of the time so and it's also well it's a foundation to this practice and I I thought I wanted to kind of I didn't wasn't sure who was gonna come so it's always hard for me to know <laughs> um, but I felt like um, going a little bit back to the the basics of the practice and make sure that this is all um, well first that sutta is really makes it clear on many levels many things how to practice the Brahma Viharas with the seven supports of awakening and uh, where each of them leads and this is usually we have the Brahma Vihara sequence like from one to another like in the Sankhita Sutta he will say 
you should practice um, it almost sounds like um, you can practice any of them at any point you know and that's true you can do that then there's specific situations for each of them like he would say like practice metta when there's anger you know when you're mo mostly like a <laughs> when you're an angry person <laughs> you should practice more metta <laughs> uh, then when uh, somebody comes at you that you don't like or like from somebody or something that there's a tinge of you know unpleasantness in it then compassion is very useful then um, uh, this sa the, a sense of dissatisfaction joy is also very useful it's the complete opposite of, of uh, being wary being uh, out of energy dissatisfied then the joy will is the complete opposite of that state and the equanimity is often when uh, he will talk about this when there's a uh, <laughs> things get to a level of abuse or something <laughs> that is a bit over the notch then you can actually like if it's too much and system goes into overdrive <laughs> and often we see that naturally also people go into equanimity or a kind of a level or balanced kind of mind state or but that's also quite useful when somebody gets really abusive towards you or towards anybody and it's a way of just like disconnecting and but that's one way of practicing those then there's also a sequence from metta to karuna to uh, mudita to pekka because they're each of them as the Buddha says and as it's possible to see in your own direct experience that each of them is goes a little bit further every time and so there is also a sequence so we can practice those individually separately and develop wholesome qualities very wholesome qualities but also there is a sequence to them which can also be developed and is useful to know and this is the sutta where this is talked about um, I just started talking right away and I'm just like yari 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 <laughs> did, did, you, did you have anything you wanted to say like I, I usually ask how you're doing <laughs> and all these things you're all good am i am i too uh, drivey forward right now okay okay good <laughs> okay <laughs> okay good i don't know sometimes you know um and that's in the that's in the samyutta nikaya the blue book and it's um, in the it's in the last chapter, the last um, book of the Samhita, and th that's the great book, and that's in the um, number forty six, chapter forty six, uh, on the supports of awakening. That's where you find this sutta. And I have big fingers, so sometimes I don't touch the good. Okay, so 54. Filled with love, and that's uh, Metta Sahagata. Sahagata, also Bhikkhu Bodhi translates, this sutta it translates as a accompanying by loving kindness. So it also means to follow, to, to come with Sahagata. And it can also be translated as filled with so this is uh, pointing to uh, developing each of the seven supports of awakening filled with any of the four Brahma Viharas which is what we're gonna see and hear
And so this is when the, the Buddha is living with the Kolians. In a small Kolian village named Alida, Alida Vasana. Then many monks take their bowl and robes and go, go to town. And they think, but it's too early. <laughs> and what could they do? Well, they could visit the ashram of other wanderers because that's what they did at that time. They often went to visit some other spiritual folks to see what they had to say <laughs> and uh, discuss about their practice. And there's no social media on internet at that time, so that's the social media right there. You just go to somebody else's ashram and you just see what they have to say. <laughs> and see if your teachers you know I, I guess that's a, in a way uh, the, how people kind of also tested their own you know it's good it's good to test your own practice <laughs> does it hold the route does it hold the road um, to compare with other things and this is a this is a good discourse for that particularly because it's uh, it's really making uh, clear what what the Buddha meant as how to practice these it's not like just any any ways uh, and I'll try to kind of give a few options that could arise that wouldn't that wouldn't be exactly that would be leaving the the pattern here the, that the Buddha kind of means how to practice And after having rejoiced and been, been welcomed, they sat down together. Then the wanderers of different tradition asked, Friends, the Samana Gotama teaches Dhamma to his followers, saying, Come, monks, let go of the five hindrances, the impurities of the mind that impair conscious discernment. Meditate with a heart filled with love, suffusing one direction, a second, a third, and a fourth, above, below, and everywhere across, to all living beings in this boundless universe. Meditate with a heart filled with love, vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience. Meditate with a heart filled with compassion, and the same thing, Meditate with a heart filled with joy. And meditate with a heart filled with calm, suffusing one direction, a second, a third, and a fourth, above, below, and everywhere across, to all that is, all living beings in this boundless universe. Meditate with a heart filled with calm, vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience. And then they say, we also, friends, teach our students in the same way, saying basically everything that he just said, including let go of the five hindrances. But this, um, this is something that happens quite often, actually, <laughs> that people will say, yeah, we practice just the same. And sometimes a little bit but um, the Buddha's teaching is quite specific it's quite it leads to a very specific place and it leads and it has to be done in a specific way for it to bring the results that he talks about so <laughs> oops <laughs> Um, and I, I, I took the lead first, but he's actually going to say it right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so he, and, they, and then they say, here, friends, there is no difference, no distinction, 
between other samanas and the Gautama's discourses, teachings, and instructions. When this was said, the monks neither rejoiced nor approved nor reproved. They stood up and left, thinking, we shall learn the proper answer for this in the presence of the Buddha. And that's often what they would do whenever they would hit a wall, whenever they, would, they wouldn't know what to say, like what to answer. Instead of saying something that they don't know, they're not sure, they're actually, they go back to the Buddha and ask him. And they, he clarifies this and this is the the subject of this very sutta is how to answer that question uh, because it does happen quite often that other people will say that's no that's what they're doing but later in the afternoon after alms round they went to the awakened one paid loving respects sat down in front of him and said here bante and told him all that occurred. Monks, this is when this is said by wanderers of other traditions, you should ask them, how is the liberation of the heart by love developed? Where does it lead to? What is its limit? What is its fruit? What is its culmination? How is the liberation of the heart by compassion developed? How is the liberation of the heart by joy developed? How is the liberation of the heart by calm developed? Where does it lead to? What is its limit? What is its fruit? What is its culmination? And we'll see here, each of them have their limit is a little bit further every time, just a little bit. And only the Buddha knew these things at that time because, uh, well, he was the only one talking about it <laughs> anyways. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people claiming the same, same practices, but that they uh, actually didn't, they were not skilled in, in this particular attainment. Ask, the, ask in this way, monks, practitioners from other teachings will be unable to proceed further and they will most likely be at a loss. Because, why? Because, monks, it is not their field, not their domain. Monks, I see nobody in this world of devas and maras and brahmas, of samanas and brahmanas, this era of kings and people who could satisfy a person's mind by answering this other than the truth finder, the Tathagata, or one of his disciples, or one who has learned it from them. How is the liberation of the heart by love developed? Where does it lead to? What is its limit? What is its fruit? What is its culmination? Here, monks, one develops the awakening support of awareness filled with love, supported by letting go, calming down, release, and culminating in surrender. <laughs> I write relaxation in this version. I've kind of kept going back and forth. Bhikkhu Bodhi calls it, calls this one release actually, which culminates in release. I mean, we can play with words a little bit, but it's kind of pointing at the same, same, relatively uh, same ground. Um, And now this is where it gets interesting because we don't only, we, we do practice this boundless love, but there's many aspects of life and there's many aspects of the Dhamma and there's many aspects of the practice. And that's why I wanted to do this, talk about this today because this covers really good bases of the practice and it's making it... Uh, making it very clear 
So um, in Pali, this is Viveka Nisitang, uh, calming Viraga Nisitang, Niroda Nisitang, and Vosaga Parinami. And so here we have. I'm I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about these four because they come back every time each of the seven supports of awakening and the seven reoccur every brahma vihara so <laughs> these are like very like there's seven times four <laughs> 28 they happen 28 times during that sutta so i think it's probably worthwhile to kind of look at that what that really means because it seems to be these four words are they come back very often in fact the Buddha says that Viveka Nisittang, Viraga Nisittang, Niroda Nisittang, Vosaga Parinami he says that for also the in in relation to the Eightfold Path he will take the eight spoke path if you look in the collected discourses uh, the section on the path Magga Samhita uh, a lot of the, those suttas he will break down the path he won't say the usual what we're used to what we're used to here of the path he will say here one develops wise wise understanding uh, supported by letting go, supported by calming down, supported by cessation, supported by or release, what I call release, and supported by surrender. It's supported and in, I remember in this, when I first started translating these suttas, what came to mind was to actually uh, to translate it as not supported but actually leading towards or leaning towards these things these four qualities um, depending on what <laughs> what you like most in your mind I guess but um, supported is also good it's it's really like that would be the really the Nisitang would be that's 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 what it means. It's like rooted in there, in that soil. Um, but to practice, also going towards that, to kind of implement that also. So it's not just boundless love. It's boundless love uh, with the awakening factor of awareness, which is an one aspect of it which is supported by these four qualities and so that's where we find the right effort or wise practice really because the the practicing the boundless love is the I guess you could say the second fold of the of wise practice uh, where you would bring up generate cultivate um, develop wholesome states but the first fold of letting go letting go and relaxing pasadi also um, that is not really talked about right in the brahma viharas and it's um, one of the things i look i've been looking for a lot when i translate and when i read the suttas is a place where which dis which are the suttas where I can find this, the the letting go aspect with the Brahma Viharas because just the Brahma Viharas themselves, they're not they don't explain that they don't explain the kind of you have to let go of also, like how how that happens. And so I mean like it it comes back twenty eight times in that sutta, so I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> yeah so if you're like so and you know like these th these words like the six r's they're really close to that you know they're they're and the seven supports of awakening also 
because I mean, let's say if you want to know where is the recognize for example well that's awareness and that's discernment the, the next support of awakening so see here it, it's it's all there and it's all making sense so it's really explained it's just that you have to kind of see it the right way so that it, it makes sense personally I, you know that I always like to f follow exactly the words of the Buddha but that doesn't mean that uh, other ways of seeing it don't work actually that's I'm just proving it right now <laughs> that it's actually integrated in there um, so I like to also take time here because it's quite profound like it's quite it's quite a lot to take in right it's quite uh, there's many <laughs> many aspects of it there's there's okay there's the boundless love okay how does that work like, you know like it's like okay this you know suffusing the entire universe <laughs> with love okay <laughs> that's a good start <laughs> and then but then it doesn't stop there it's like oh okay <laughs> sure <laughs> that's uh, what's next buddha <laughs> No, now you practice this with awareness. Oh, okay. But that's just a word. What does he mean by that? So what's what's that awareness thing? Which I call it awareness. This is sati. This is mindfulness. Uh, in if you look at other translations, that's what it's going to be. So. Um, Well, awareness, usually the Buddha describes as the four resting places, right? The four satipatthanas, the four... I'm kind of leaning towards uh, the natural abiding places of awareness also. Because that's just where are the natural resting places, or natural abidings of presence. That's what I also was leaning towards. The, and these are just the things, you know, that we're that we can be aware of for ourselves. When the Buddha says, "Be an island unto yourself," he's talking about that. He's talking because anything else is beyond that. Anything else is not on your island. <laughs> your island is this: is body, is experience, it's what's happening in your mind, and dhamma, mental states as dhamma. But awareness here, I would say, you know, even though we say body, like awareness of body, the thing is that ultimately the Buddha, when he talks about awareness, is always awareness of mind, awareness of mental states, because that's what really, that's what really we're talking about here. So if we want to really boil it down to a sim simple, simple thing, is that being aware but being aware of what of mental states and that's that's where it could branch out that's where it could branch out into other practices like being aware of something outside then that's not the buddha's teaching anymore that's wrong mindfulness or unwise mindfulness unwise awareness if i follow my my uh my own lexicon <laughs> or my own uh, glossary <laughs> I don't know which is the most appropriate word <laughs> um, because I use wise for samma and awareness for sati so but see the Buddha didn't teach awareness of the six senses actually he, he taught to let go of that and he taught awareness of mind awareness of mental states I mean if we were not gonna be aware of mental states we couldn't tell mental states apart we can tell that we're angry or and the body is useful to know that because there's tension how does anger feel it feels feels terrible these unwholesome states whatever it is whatever it is it doesn't feel good in the body and that's from there you can actually develop the wisdom and let go and let go and instantly 
we see it feels better, it feels uplifting. And but how could we even do that if we were not even aware of our mental states? So that's that's what it really means. And so one develops the awakening support of awareness filled with boundless love. Then whenever boundless love fades, then we know. Then that's how we know. That's how we cultivate this. So the, when we say cultivating or developing, that means it's not going to be steady all the time. You know? <laughs> that means it's not going to be like perfect all the time that's why we need to do it we need to cultivate we need to develop um, and that's where the awareness comes in right there is we're we're aware when it's when awareness is filled of of love and we're and because of awareness we know when it's not anymore or so so it's not like here another interpretation that could be misleading is like you really have to force awareness full packed full <laughs> with love <laughs> but that's that's not it that's not it it's just loving awareness filled with love and when the love fades it's you bring it up again you let go of whatever hindrance arises I mean I have to kind of go into other supports of awakening a little bit like <laughs> but the, the the Dhamma it's not completely disjointed actually it's very it's cohesive it comes together so it's really hard to really isolate one thing but I'm trying to really um, put awareness on a pedestal right now <laughs> so that we can we can look at it clearly and then we're it just gonna go down from the pedestal and the next one will be discernment or investigation we're gonna look at it <laughs> so that's that's just the awareness okay good so now we have this boundless love filled awareness filled with love and that's 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 the aspect we're looking into right now but all of this is supported nisitang by viveka viraga uh, niroda and vulsaga and it culminates into vulsaga and vulsaga is i like surrender but that's that's me <laughs> Viveka, where do we find this? Oh. <laughs> what a great answer. <laughs> Sounds like you heard it before. <laughs> Good. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Viveka Jang Piti Sukang. Yes, actually. And this is first jhana. And there's it comes twice I guess in the first jhana it comes uh, no it comes three times sorry we 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 kamehi so um, letting go of desire sen sense desires sensory engagement and we uh, he akusalehi dhammehi and so uh, akusala dhamma so akusala dhamma is akusala unwholesome the hindrances dhamma is states so uh, letting go of all the hindrances in other suttas of course we, we see it in the truths of the the fruits of the truth seeking life where he explains this whole sequence before we get there um, 
and he explains how each hindrance is like you know somebody like a, in jail in a desert journey through the really harsh place uh, and in, in prison and debt someone that's in debt and he gives um, all these really uh, quite quite um, vivid similes to for us to to understand what these things are and someone who's free from that is like free from somebody that's free from debt <laughs> oh great <laughs> free from uh, notaries <laughs> and uh, <laughs> house, house selling paperwork and stuff like that doesn't that feel great <laughs> it's like uh, so much like such a load off uh, and uh, that and uh, our I just said that <laughs> uh, prison which slavery a desert journey you come upon an oasis how does that feel it's like oh <laughs> great <laughs> just like this this uh, this pond and you're just like swimming in it and drinking the water <laughs> kind of thing. so it feels like really good and that's really how the Buddha says that's how it feels for someone who's practicing this and that's it's so true the more we practice this the more that's really what it, we feel is that when these hindrances l lift off when I, I was keep talking about my airplane takeoff simile is really like when you go and you're under the clouds it's raining and it's and then it's taken it's heavy the plane is like going like 10 kilometers an hour and it's like clumsy <laughs> and, then, and then it just hits a track and then it's like kind of like the, the beginning kind of starts to go and it takes off and in no long time you just you just go through a pack of clouds and it's just but you just keep going you know you're kind of you know the gas is pushed up and you know that everything is behind you going behind going behind and then at some point you just whoop you come out from the clouds and everything is like bluebird sky <laughs> and you look and it's like oh these clouds <laughs> so and that's really how it feels it's like um, uh, so that's that's a really good example of Viveka that's what I think uh, is when you come out you just let all these things it takes a little bit of time sometimes because whatever the hindrance we always think we kind of depending of on how how much we give it importance how much we feed it then it might take us a little bit of time to kind of deconstruct that kind of engagement because we need to kind of re uh, kind of detach ourselves from that that's why it's um, uh, the word uh, the verb for viveka is uh, vivichati vivichati means really like separating or and that's the word I choose to translate in letting go in an active sense because there's a lot of adverbs in Pali and for us we don't really speak like that it's 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 too passive we don't like we don't speak always at the past tense you know <laughs> with like <laughs> very passive adverbs like for us the thing is that what happens when we do that is that s there's a tendency of not practicing properly there's a practice there's a tendency of flattening the path kind of thing which is not it's not the right way it's not it's actually a development and it's there is um, there is an action there is an action an effort required it's not it's not like lifting weights effort <laughs> it's why wise, wise effort is the right kind of effort it's is to actually effort is effort is retreat that's what effort is effort is every morning when you wake up and you sit or every evening when that's effort it's not like <laughs> like that effort 
has nothing to do with that. It's actually, and the Buddha is quite clear. Like if, if you know the suttas, the Buddha, he's really clear about that. Energy, virya, he, he says it, it's like some, some monks would think, because that's a problem that happened too at his time when he was teaching. Some monks would hear it, that and they would like walk and like they would like be really intense like walking meditationers and and like their feet would just bleed all over the place they would like walk there's some even a monk that died like because that's what he thought that was like energy oh i will like i will <laughs> i will bring forth energy like because sometimes the buddha can be quite you know when he says you know like uh you should um, bring forth energy. He, he can be pretty convincing. <laughs> but we also have to balance that out. We have, to, we have to be wise. We have to be... And that's where the five faculties come into play. Like That's when the energy must be balanced with tranquility or collectedness, samadhi, and faith with discernment. But they're all kind of... They're together... So we do this. Because the Buddha definitely praises each of these, you know, each of these faculties. They're not one better than the other. He says, like, you need to cultivate the, these. Like, we need to cultivate all seven awakening supports. It's like the awakening factors. He says they need to be balanced out in some suttas. In some other suttas, he explains them in a linear way. So, Sometimes he will explain it with uh, Viveka Nisittang, Viraga Nisittang, uh, Niroda Nisittang, Bosaga Parinami. He will say that, in fact, if you look in the suttas, the most often times you will see an actual breakdown of the seven supports of awakening. He's going to use these four qualities, each of them. And that's how they, how do you, he says, how do you develop the seven supports of awakening? He says, one develops the support of awakening of awareness supported by letting go, calming down, release, and culminating in surrender. And then each of them, like this. So that's, I, I'm pretty sure that's the most reoccurring sequence that he uses. So that's, it's really interesting when you start discovering these things. When you're like looking at the patterns that come back the most often in his teaching. And these four qualities, they are very uh, prominent. They really, uh, they come back in the Eightfold Path, like I said, the Seven Supports of Awakening. Um, and so uh, coming back to our Viveka. <laughs> so for me, this is really a, a, a word that I've chosen to translate as letting go because it's a bit more active and for us there's no there's no real poly word that has been translated like that in letting go and for us in English I feel like it is a word that is very important in this practice because we it's really what that practice is it's about letting go and uh, I think how 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 do you um, detach? How do you separate the mind? Basically, is I mean, this is very conceptual if you look at it like that. But if you say you let go, then it becomes tangible. It becomes something that oh yeah, I can do that. You know, but like mental detachment if I say that with mental detachment then it's like it feels like it's it feels a bit incomplete it feels like there's it's there's not much of an action in this but there is an action it's very important so the action is to detach the mind from engaging in the senses all the time but how you do that is you let go and then the next one is Viraga, and that's another one that. Um, where is this one found? <laughs> We're all looking. <laughs> it's not too far from the last one you said. <laughs> uh, <the second> one? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, actually, yes. Well, uh, the four foundations of mindfulness. Uh, and the four foundations of mindfulness, that would be uh, Vinaya Loke Abhija Dhovanasthan. It's Vinaya. Vinaya is also another word I translate as letting go. But um, Viraga is actually um, in the third jhana. Third jhana because they say uh, that's where piti, uh, piti ya viraga. So uh, the the um, when the piti when the joy which uh, I say the stronger joy uh, calms it it, it it calms down. So this word viraga, now we, we're reading my translation, so it's not really obvious, but if you pick up another translation, it's going to be dispassion. <laughs> so this is the word that is translated as dispassion, that famous word. And we need to understand that raga, where that comes from, is actually raga is a bit like craving. Like uh, raga is like uh, that desire or something you know, for XYZ and that when the PED the Pali English Dictionary was written in I can't remember what year but that's a long time ago it's uh, early 1900s uh, if not earlier than that and the first translations done I was looking at um, you know the when Oldenburg uh, came out with his poly like uh, Roman script uh, uh, poly canon you know he'd taken like all the cinema and all the you know like the, the all these a Asian scripts and put it into Roman and came up with that. That was a long time ago. <laughs> and then people at uh, Oxford uh, and around, you know, many countries, PTS, Polytech Society, they started translating these. That's a long time ago. That's very, very archaic language that is fitting the the cultural context and of that era and and the major spiritual current of that time which you know which one it is and so the word raga being translated as passion is very old it's very very old for us we wouldn't really you know that's it. and the thing is that Theravada Buddhism for amazing reasons is very conservative <laughs> but because uh, it has cons it has a it has a tendency to be very conservative uh, because it wants to preserve the word of the Buddha which is an amazing thing but then languages evolve and situations change and for us the word passion is not very suitable it's not very fitting for us because we're more in we're in a very different place in time and in history so um, and to say the word dispassion is is not is not really in our context in our society it's quite uh, it's quite negative it has a very negative um, uh, taste to it, turn to it. So, because when you say someone is uh, dispassionate, usually it's not a really good thing, <laughs> you know. And I understand in what way, you know, the Buddha's teaching, when practiced properly, it can lead to, you know, being lucid you know about things and that's more a word that I would use perhaps but 
not the word dispassionate. It feels a bit, it's a bit, uh, it can be a bit, uh, yeah, uh, problematic in a lot of circumstances. Now, the thing is also that we know a lot more about Pali than before <laughs> because these people, like, uh, you know, the, the first translators, you often read in their preface, like, that they didn't really know. <laughs> they, knew, they knew a lot of the words, but a lot of the time they were kind of making attempts at finding the real meaning of these words, you know, and they're quite honest about it. Or, you know, when you read I.B. Orner's translation, which is, you know, an upgrade from a 50 year bef prior that to her um, uh, translation, where she says, well, um, I'm quite, you know, uh, quite grateful for their work and everything, uh, even though at times quoting the person that was before her that it was nothing less than like uh, scrambling in the dark you know like <laughs> trying to find the meaning of some words so that's just to let you know how this is all coming up you know like the the PED is old and it's 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 and it's been old for a long time <laughs> so, and even in I.B. Horner's translation who she says she noticed that <laughs> is a is a pretty old translation already <laughs> so so there's already newer translations that are getting old now <laughs> that have been done i just i just really want to give a context for these words because it's really important for us to understand and you know like i was saying uh, B buddhism for for very amazing reasons is quite conservative but also in another way it has conserved a lot of not so appropriate words in English that actually like these a lot of these things were attempts to find the meaning but it doesn't mean that that's what exactly that's what it means and all this to say <laughs> that viraga it's not the only way you can translate viraga if you look that up it doesn't just mean dispassion. <laughs> it means also something that viraga it means like the raga is also excitement. It's also this, you know, this kind of it is being taken, like excited, that passionate state. Well, it's for us it's more like excitement about something, you know. So it's more like being unexcited or calming down that's that's also what it means it means fading away but see that's that's another thing that's being used a lot in the scriptures is it fades away now personally i like to translate it as calming down so viraga something that is becomes less excited we raga so and niroda niroda is sometimes i've translated it as release um, but it doesn't always carry the whole of the meaning but that's another place where you can find Niroda doesn't just mean the end goal Niroda. Like, see here, he's talking about Niroda. It's actually leaning towards there. It's actually supported by it's these states. They're supported by these qualities, and Niroda is one of, of them. So that's, that's quite interesting. Oh, so now I'm practicing this loving kindness, but it has to go to like this release, this cessation. But how does that work? So this creates like really interesting paths. And Niroda is actually Nir uh, um, Rodati, Rudjati, 
near uh, another word that you will find you will find that word in other forms which is nirujati and that means also becoming unobstructed it's like uh, run rundati is rundati is to be obstructed or kind of stuck <laughs> and nirundati is like unstucking <laughs> coming unstuck so see that's another that's another really interesting that's the thing that you that happens when you fought spend hours in front of the poly english dictionary <laughs> so you get to see all of the possible meanings of it and then you go down the rabbit hole as far as you can go <laughs> and you break down the word and then you go into the sanskrit dictionary and then you you find a root and then you find the Sanskrit dictionary and you go find all the other ones and and you can't always do that because Pali is not always exactly you know a, what you would think it is in Sanskrit like sometimes the word it sounds like it would be a certain word but it's actually not it's just that the way that it's said or it depends where the Buddha said that because he moved around a lot in northern India and these were different dialects so there's huge chance that he didn't just speak one language he knew different dialects and so uh, Pali is a bit of a mixed bag of every everything uh, so sometimes um, we cannot rely on the Sanskrit background either because actually the Pali was translated into Sanskrit afterwards even though Pali is a kind of a close cousin or it's almost like a Sanskrit slang almost but <laughs> um, the Buddha's words were l much later actually wrote down into Sanskrit so Nirujati Niroda Nisitta and also this is this is a place where because because we have to ask ourselves like what does he mean like it has to go to cessation like it's supported by cessation cessation of what unwholesome states that's what he means it's it's always that's his path Hmm? Free. Yes, exactly. But in an unobstructed way, I guess. Right? This is, I think, uh, that's what he means.